thank you all so much for coming to this virtual Q&A in honor of World Down Syndrome Day. This day is intentionally held on March 21st because it's the 21st day of the third month. And that's signifying the uniqueness of triplication of the 21st chromosome, which is what causes Down syndrome. Uh, we're really happy to have you all here. I just wanna set the stage for this event really quickly. I'm Carmen Vincent, the director and producer of Teacher of Patients, a 30 minute documentary in progress about Tom, Tina and Emily, who you see here named as the Felters. Um, and it's about their pursuit of educating their community about Down syndrome. And right now we're raising, we're fundraising to complete the film and you all have graciously donated um, to get a ticket to this event and all of that will go towards finishing the film. Um, I'm gonna drop a link to our website uh, if you feel compelled to share it with your friends or family or colleagues. Uh, we're always happy to get in front of more eyes so we can get this film funded and start making a difference with it. Without further ado, I'm gonna pass the mic over to Tom, Tina, and Emily to introduce themselves. Go ahead, guys. Happy Sunday, everybody. Happy World Down Syndrome Day. Thank you all for joining us. Um, those of you that we already know, thank you for coming. Those that we that we're just meeting, that is awesome to meet you guys. Thank you for joining us today. Um, at the moment, at the moment, we're in a we're in a good spot, um, attitude-wise, if nothing else. So. Um, that may change at any moment, so if it does, I apologize. But that's kind of that's kind of what it's uh, kind of what happens here. So, um, but but like Carmen said, whatever you guys want to talk about, we're here to talk about. I'm Tina. I'm Emily's mom. <laughs> that's can you, it. Can you I, say hi, Miss Emily? Say hi. Say hi. Look, see everybody. Do you guys want to give a quick background about what you do for a living? Um, I work in labor and delivery at Northwest Health. Porter. I've been there for 24 years, all of which have been in labor and delivery. And I'm, I'm a paramedic. I work on an ambulance with the same hospital. I've uh, been there about the same time. And Emily, what does Emily do? Emily lives her best life at home. She <laughs> still lives with, excuse me, she lives at home with Tom and I. Um, she enjoys riding her bike. She loves her phone. She loves crafts. How old is she? She's 20, I'm sorry, she's 25. And um, she has one older sister, Sarah, who's 33. And then she has three nephews, Ethan, who's six, and twins, Owen and Wyatt, who will be two in May. Right? Yeah. Do you have, do you have nephews? Do you have nephews? Ethan, Owen, and Wyatt? <laughs> okay, very cool. She may talk. Well, well, it's hard to say. Absolutely. Great. If anyone has any burning questions right away and would like to be brave and start us off, um, feel free to raise your hand or type in the chat that you have a question. We'd be happy to call on you. I have a question. Um, what do you think people need to know about Down syndrome? Holy cow. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, one of our sticking points has always been the stereotypes that, that exist with Down syndrome. Um, for the most part, she, she lives her best life. She's, she's happy. She, she, she does fun stuff. But, uh, if you were signed on early enough just now, you saw that we were not in a good place. Um, and she really was not going to participate at all. Um, that, that, uh, has, has been described by me and by many others as, as a flip of a switch. And sometimes we never know when that's going to come. The switch will flip, and it might happen as we're sitting here. The switch is going to flip, and she's not having a good time. Uh, when that happens, um, it's it's sometimes hard to, based on where we're at and what we're doing at the time, it's either something that's easy to deal with or not. Um, so, I mean, it's been in restaurants. You know, we've you know we've entered the restaurant and a place that she likes to go. And then something, something just ticks her off, like a, a, a baby in the background that decides to cry, either it be laughter or in anger, and that just sets her off. And it changes the tone, it changes the mood, you know, and it puts us on edge, it puts her on edge. So, and, 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 and sometimes it's hard to anticipate those triggers if we walk into a restaurant and we're seated completely by ourselves with nobody around us and then now and we're halfway through a meal and then a family with two little kids can come in and they sit down and now their kids are being rambunctious which is totally fine 
totally fine, but it it doesn't sit well with Emily. I don't know if it's the tone of the cry or the pitch or whatever it might be, but you know, it just sets sets her off and it, it doesn't make a fun time. All right. And and because she has an intellectual disability, she doesn't understand the, the consequences of, of her action sometimes or understand or is able to turn that off and and do things that are more socially socially acceptable. Um, I think the the families that are with us now that also have um, uh, children with them with Down syndrome would agree that that sometimes it's just uh, it's it's just that's how it goes, and, and we just have to be patient. Yeah. Uh, that and I, and when we do our Emily talks, that's that's pretty much my my, the one thing I want everybody to come away with whenever we talk to anybody about this is be patient. Uh, for 25 years, Emily has taught us to be patient. Um, when she's not having a good time or she's not ready to leave, she's not ready to transition to anything else. That's the way to we're, go. Yeah, we're not, we're not gonna transition until she's ready to. And if we're in a, if we're in a situation where that's, where that's okay, then it's okay. We, we sit around, we take our time, but, um, to answer your question, that's a big, a big misconception that they're always happy. They're always they're happy, happy because it's just not true. Um, she she has emotions just like everybody else, but because of her disability, she has a much harder time processing those those um, emotions and processing what's coming out, what's going on around her, and and sometimes it's just too much for her to handle. Okay. That's that's the short answer. Believe it or not. <laughs> Can you explain quickly what the Emily Talk is? The Emily Talk is, is something that we put together uh, where we, we go in and, and talk to whoever will sit still and listen to me for about an hour, talk about um, how, how, Emily, how Emily lives. So, you know, we talk about our life. We talk about um, her disability. We talk about a lot of other disabilities. Um, but mostly it's trying to convince people that... Um, if you need to be patient with her or anybody else until until we can get the desired of desired outcome, then you have to be patient with them. Yeah. Um, this my because of my background in emergency services, that talk was initially geared towards emergency services, police, fire, EMS, dispatchers. Uh, now it's kind of it's kind of uh, branched out into like I said, whoever will sit still and listen to me ramble for an hour. Uh, Emily Emily typically uh, accompanies me on those talks. And depending on her mood, she's going to participate or she's not. But as I tell everybody in the talk, that's that's part of what I want you to learn. Sometimes she's going to participate in life. Sometimes she's not. So you just kind of have to roll with it, right? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. If we're if we're someplace that if we're ready to transition from leaving the restaurant to going home, and she's not ready to go, we sit at the table and we order another drink or whatever, and you know until she's ready to go. One, one time we were at the zoo and she decided she didn't want to go any further and she sat down in an intersection at Brooklyn, uh, Brookfield Zoo. Now normally we can just, you know, let her just figure it out and then get up and stand and walk away. But in this particular situation, it got ugly. We had to drag her out of the road because it was a safety, you know, you know, obviously we didn't, it was dark and we were worried about her getting hurt. And of course it made a very ugly scene, but I mean, that's just, that's just part of life. I mean, that, that particular situation I remember, and I, I feel horrible about how it played out, but at the end of the day, we had to keep her safe and getting her out of that intersection when she decided to sit down, you know, it's dark, cars are coming around, and I could just see her, you know, us standing around here trying to protect her, and all of a sudden a car hits us and runs her over. So, you know, the, the, the safest thing for us to do was to drag her out of that intersection, but, you know, it made a scene, and it was just, it was ugly. It was... It was not. It was not fun. But. <laughs> now, but the flip side of that is, um, she has to get regular blood draws because she has hypothyroidism. So we have to go to the hospital, and she has a good blood draw. That's that is normally a, a kind of a big event in itself. Uh, one particular time, it went fine. We got the blood draw. Her and I walked out to the waiting room. Emily decides she's going to sit in the waiting room because that's what I'm going to do right now. Um, there was no reason to push the issue. I had nowhere else to go. We had nowhere else to be. So we sat. We're ready to leave. But we sat in that waiting room for an hour. I played on my phone for an hour until she decided, all right, we can go. There was no, there was no 
trigger that I could see, she just decided I'm gonna sit down and we're gonna wait for a while. So we did. And, and like I said, there was no reason to go anywhere to, to do anything about that. So we were patient and waited it out. How does she do with the blood draw? Is that okay? <laughs> It depends. Yeah, that depends. Some some go better. Okay. Some go better than others, you know. And and normally the blood draws are at uh, Porter, where Tom and I both work. And so I, you know, I usually start the conversation by, "Hi, this is Emily." And by the way, Emily, I work with these people, so be nice. <laughs> I may have the occasion to see them. So you know, it's just hit or miss. Some blo blood draws go very very well, and some are incredibly ugly. And yeah, the, yeah. When, um, they're actually much better now, but they starting out it was it took both of us and two lab techs yeah. to hold her down and and safely do a blood draw without any of us getting hit, Hurt. bitten, kicked. Yeah. Um, but over time they've certainly gotten now, better. She two weeks ago, last week, and she just recently went in for her first COVID shot, which we were dreading. Dreading. But it was it was nice as pie. Yeah. She sat down, got her shot, <laughs> we were out a the door. Well, I wouldn't say disappointed. We were it was kind of a letdown because we there was so much thought put into this this you know getting her her shot and us getting there and us being there and then when he she gave her the vaccine Tom and I looked at each other and I'm like that's it it's over <laughs> what we go now I mean it was very very anticlimactic <laughs> but that's that's there's no sh there's no shame in that yeah I want to move on we have two more questions right now um, I'm not sure what your name is but iPhone. XS Max? Gail? Gail, is that Gail? Uh, Would you like to unmute and ask your Hi. Hi, Gail. Yeah, yeah, I do. Ah. Okay. Hi, you remember me? You I do, I do. How are you? Tina? And yeah. Good, good. And Tom, I, I, I thought, well, I don't even know if they remember me. I used to work in labor and delivery a long time ago and a nurse at the hospital there. For My question is, um, Emily's an adult now, and I'm sure she wants to hang out with other kids. And does she get to do that? And, and is she going to get a chance to live on her own? Well, that's a good question. You know, of course, we have to, we have to, that's a, that's a, that's a tough one. I mean, I can't, we just can't turn her loose. We just, someone just can't come and say, hey, can Emily come hang out with us? And then open the door and away she goes. You know, we, those situations are are unique and very thought out. So like Carmen, we've gotten to know Carmen really well. I would feel fine with Emily going with Carmen. And it's not so much of the interaction, it's her, the person with Emily being able to deal with her outbursts or, or whatever the case may be. Um, you know, she still needs a little help in the bathroom toileting. So I, you know, the person that she was with or would be with would be taking on that responsibility of knowing that they, if she needed help in the bathroom, oh. they'd be able to do that. Um, living on her own, um, I don't think that that, I mean, she could surprise us, but at this point in her life, I don't think that that's a possibility. I think she just would require too much care and she's still a flight risk. I worry about her leaving and not coming back. <laughs> and, and we just don't know, not that, not that group homes are never the answer. So, I mean, that works fine for some people, but in, in her case, in her situation, we feel much better just keeping her at home, yeah. letting her ride her bike. Say hi, say hi, Ross. Yeah. So, Kiko and Tina, when oh. Emily's having a bad day, how do you guys support one another? Uh, that's that's a <laughs> tough one because we're that that's a tough one because sometimes we don't always agree. Like he wants to, he thinks that we should approach it in this way, and I think we should let her be. You know, so that we're at odds a lot about different things. Like she likes, listen, she's 25. She doesn't want to go to bed when we go to bed. We're old, you know, we're in bed by nine o'clock and sometimes she wants to stay up and watch TV. And Tom thinks that she should be in bed asleep when we go to sleep. And I'm like, just let her be. If she wants to stay up and watch TV, let her, let her be. And I think that that is a big struggle for us because he feels that, you know, when we go to bed, she should go to bed. Don't you agree? Oh, absolutely. I agree, honey. That's a... <laughs> so we, st we struggle on that. And sometimes she wants to sleep on her couch. You know, she's got, she's got, we've made a, one of our bedrooms into her apartment, we refer to it as, and she's got a really nice couch in there. And sometimes she just wants to sleep on her couch and watch TV, which I find fine. And Tom thinks that she should be in her bed. So do you not agree? Do you not think? 
I think that's, I think you said it wonderfully, honey. <laughs> I couldn't have put it better myself. And sarcasm. <laughs> <laughs> Rob, did that answer your question? I don't even know. Yes. It okay. Did. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. We have a question in the chat from Kathy Costanzo, who is my grandma, wonderful grandma. Hi, grandma. Um, ah! Emily, she actually has a question for you. And the question is, what is your favorite thing? Your bike. I, I'll answer her for her. It's her bike. I do. Okay. It's her bike. For the fridge. Okay, I'll just put it right here. It's her bike the or fridge. her bike okay, or her I'll phone. I'll just hold it for a second. Can you the talk fridge. about our swing set? In a second. Em. Oh, I forgot about our swing set. Oh, we put a swing set up practically in our front yard. Listen, I'll just put it right here. It's kind of off to the oh. side because she absolutely loves okay. to swing. Okay. She absolutely loves to swing, and um, a, a, a regular you, a regular swing set is just not big enough for her. I mean, and she just wants to swing. She doesn't want the slide or any of the extra things that go along with it. So we built us we built from scratch a swing set off to the side off of our front porch, so we can sit in the house or on the porch or wherever the case may be, and we can um, let her swing. And she. It took her a while to warm up to it. She wasn't crazy about it at first, but she loves, loves, loves to swing. Um, Jason, oh, sorry. Well, along the lines of favorite things, since we just had to deal with drinks, um, her two favorite drinks are Gold Peak, Diet Gold Peak, which is sweetened, and Dr. Pepper. Uh, the Gold Peak that we have that I tried to give her just now was not sweetened, so she was not having it. So we went back to a, diet, a Dr. Pepper, which apparently, she didn't want it. She wanted the Gold Peak. Um, so I'm content to hold it, but she wanted, she was absolutely adamant that that Gold Peak, uh, that Dr. Pepper go to the fridge. So so as you saw, probably we, we had to we had to move about the room to put that back in the fridge so that we don't... To make our life good. So that we can move on. <laughs> um, Jason, if, you, if you're willing, we would love to have you unmute yourself and ask your question. Yeah, I just want to know what your support system is uh, on the parent side of uh, parents of a special needs child. What's your support system like? Where do you go um, for help or like what? How does that what does that look Ex like? Excellent question, sir. Thank you. Um, when Emily was born, it was non-existent. Yeah. Um, now uh, there, there's a group here in Northwest Indiana. It's called Chasing Dreams. Um, I, I sit on the board of directors there. Uh, there's there's other board directors board. There's other directors that are that are in this Zoom meeting with us now. There's other families that are in this meeting with us now, uh, and so those that organization has brought together even virtually brought together families that um, from all over this area that have not just not just Down syndrome in their family, but autism and and just all manner of disabilities. Uh, that group that the organization. Uh, caters to any disability, regardless of what it is, regardless of age. So, so it's a it's a whole big club, for lack of a better word, of people that that are on the same journey as we are, and they and those folks get what goes on here, you know. So, so just just talking to those parents, or even just knowing those parents are there and and living the same lives we are, it it helps. And our Aunt Lori. Aunt Lori. <laughs> Aunt Lori's our support system. That's enough. Be nice. Great. Um, Ashley, would you like to come on and ask your question? Hello, I'm Ashley. I am one of Carmen's filmmaker friends. So surprise, I am asking a film question. Uh, you mentioned she likes to stay up and watch TV. And so I want to know what are her favorite TV shows? And then follow that up with, um, do you ever watch anything that has uh, actors that are more like her in it, that have better representation? And do, do you respond to that? Is it good? I, I, I'll answer the, the last question first. Uh, typically, she does not, we, we don't really watch anything that, that has, um, the, like the A&E the, the series that had all down, the folks with down, down syndrome downright, um, downright yeah downright. whatever it was but it that we didn't find that representative at all of our lives um as far as what she likes to watch i mean she likes um hannah Mont um not hannah um i carly i carly um, salmon cat salmon cat 
And but weird stuff, not weird stuff, but but stuff that you wouldn't think she'd watch, like like Grace and Frankie. Grace and Frankie. <laughs> she uh, loves Grace and Queer Frankie. Eye for the Straight Guy. She loves it. She loves Queer Eye for the Straight Guy. She can navigate through Netflix to to get to that show. Yeah, loves it. Me too. Um, Grace and Frankie. I don't. Grace and Frankie. I, I'm, I'm sure she doesn't understand the dynamics of that show. But she. But loves she it. loves it. Loves it. So, In fact, she probably watches it more than we do. Yeah. But as far as, as shows representative of her, so far we haven't really found one that, that is representative of her. Yeah, I, I guess, um, sorry to speak out of turn. I just, um, I'm thinking of uh, that movie Music that just came out that was really controversial. And then the, yeah. Um, yeah. We were talking you know, about there's some scary, like Ryan Murphy stuff that's actually probably too scary, but um, th that's just where I'm, my head is Well, now. Music... M music that that whole situation was just brought to my attention this week by Carmen. Um, before before that, I had no idea that that singer I don't know, what's Sia. Sia. I had no idea she existed. Um, but once I was able to figure out that that was actually a movie and kind of track what the movie was about, um, it, it's totally inappropriate. You know, it's um, the movie did or or still does contain a scene involving prone restraint, which is something I, I hit on heavy in the Emily talk. Prone restraint, not so much with, with well, with Down syndrome too, but, but uh, kids and adults on the spectrum, when they, when they act out, it's really them not being able to process what's going on around them. Um, and so that, in order to control, okay, we'll get in a second. Now she wants her Dr. Pepper back. Uh, but in order to control that person who's acting out and you know that they will they will employ prone restraint and people are killed like that you know it's just um you know the george floyd in in minneapolis that's that's prone restraint um to to get political and and that's there's no place for that anywhere and so when a movie employs that process to to let people understand this is how we deal with people on the spectrum it's, it's totally inappropriate. Okay, so it looks like we have a couple more questions. Josh, would you like to unmute and ask? Yeah, so uh, hi, I'm Josh. Um, I was wondering for you all schedule, uh, knowing that you both work, or I guess, yeah, uh, knowing that you both work, how was the schedule with helping Emily? Well, Emily, um, if, if Tom or myself, if we're both working, then she goes to my sister-in-law Lori's house she has kind of her own space there and she's just you know she just kind of um in fact many days she'd rather be there than be home so we're lucky in that aspect that we have we have an aunt Lori. um if it weren't for her then we would have to do a whole revamping of our schedule because as it, then it would be tom and i would never be working at the same time so someone was all so somebody would always be home with emily as it turns out now you know I, you know, when my schedule comes out for six weeks, I just let her know a few weeks at a, in advance, this is what we, this is a day Emily needs to come over, you know, we'll drop her off, you know, here or there, whatever the case may be, and excuse me, whatever the case may be, and um, she just makes it so we can have a normal life. But if it weren't for that, we would have to, Tom and I would have to work opposite shifts. Thank you. Um, Vero, would you like to ask your question? Yeah. Um... I'm very curious about um, the law for um, disabled people in America because I'm, all, I'm also dealing with somebody in France and uh, I'd like to compare, um, you know, I feel like the law seems to be stronger here than it is in France, but maybe it's not. Could you tell me about the protection uh, or anything that the, um, the, the law um, will give you? Well, I don't know what that means. Protection for... Well, uh, equal, equal opportunity in education, for example? Yeah, well, in the state of Indiana, uh, disabled students are able to stay in school until age 22. Um, and so that's what Emily did. When she was 18, as, when she was a senior, we, we did an open house and she, she walked through the class. She did not graduate, she got a certificate of, of completion, but she walked through the class and then she stayed in school for three more years uh, until she was 22. Uh, when she was in 15th grade, we call it, she walked with her class again. Um, so from an education standpoint, at least in Indiana, uh, they, they are afforded the opportunity to stay in school until they're 22. Um, 
how is it implemented? I mean, um, the law said the same thing in Europe, but it's not implemented the same way in different places. And the young woman I'm, I'm, uh, I'm following, I follow her in Spain and then in France. And yeah, on paper, the law says so, but in reality, it doesn't everywhere. So that's what oh. is. Maybe the well, case, but right. yeah. in our situation, we could not have picked, I mean, the school system was amazing. Her teachers were amazing. You know, I, I, I just commend the whole process. She, you know, we, we got lucky. Uh, I mean, I, I can't speak of what you're talking about because I don't, I don't, I, I can't speak to that, but. Yeah, no, it seems like it's always about luck though. That's my problem. Well, unfortunately, I think that's, uh, there's, there's a, a, a bit of luck involved in some of that because we've talked to parents where their, their experience has not been like ours, which is, is, it's, it's too bad, but you know, I can only speak of our experience and it has been very positive. Our, her, her teacher, Kathy Witt and her teacher, Amy Lavenda from, um, Fagley. I, I mean, I would just do anything for them. They're, you know, they, we hold a special place in our heart for them because they just went above and beyond for Emily, you know, Kathy Witt now, I mean, we're still good friends with her and still feel like, you know, you know, she's a, extended part of our family but you know we speak very highly of that the whole system at Boone Grove High School where she went to school and as far as um, discrimination as far as job opportunities she's she's in a protected class so she's so so you can't dim discriminate against her any more than you discriminate against anybody else but prove it you know um, she, Emily could certainly hold a job it would be a menial task doing doing something for minimum wage if that um, she could work in a sheltered workshop, uh, making sub minimum wage. Um, but, and we've explored all those possibilities and uh, wherever she would be working, she, she would have to have uh, a one-to-one -one yeah, person would. with her to keep her safe and keep her from eloping. Um, so that another reason why we, we choose to just keep her home and, and just let her, let her live her life, you know, but, yeah. but. To your question, there's there there are laws that say you know she like I said she's a protected class, but but prove it. I mean, in the case of this young woman, she has to have a person with her at all time. But first, the person is not always there, meaning she can go to school on that day, or when the person is there, the people who are there are not really trained to deal with people right. like her. Right, and I and I and we're dealing with the people who, who they have to move, they, they have to bring from one space to another, but not with the psychological uh, um, right, right. aspect and of it. That's, that's, and they end the page. Right, and because of the family, the other families that we, that we um, interact with through Chasing Dreams, I know, there's, I know there's cases just like what you were talking about where, where we're, we would be at the mercy of that staff member showing up to, to keep her, to, to go to work with her, you know, and or be adequately trained to deal with her yeah, to deal with her when she's not, you know, she, when she decides not to have a good time, mm -hmm. I, I have to trust that that staff member can do something about that. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that trust is hard to come by. Okay. Thank you. What do you need? That's good. Yeah, thank yeah. You, well, yeah, thank you, Vero. I, I want to give Vero a shout out. She's actually our consulting editor for Teacher Patients. So you can learn more about her work by going to teacherpatients.com. She's, she's done some amazing things and she's doing amazing things right now. So thank you. Um, Robert, would you like to come on and ask your question? Actually, I have two questions. So can you talk a little about just preferred or respectful terminology? And the second question is in situations like you mentioned where she's struggling or having a bad day, like in public, like at Brookfield Zoo and so forth, should bystanders how what should they do should they ask to help or just you know that's 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 <laughs> a tough because we were actually in um we were flying to see my dad and we we're in the airport and she was not having a good time we we're going through security you know and she just was not having a good day you know it, there's a lot going on you know everybody's rushed you know if anybody looks out of place you get quite and it's just it just lends itself to to having issues and so someone behind me said what is her problem why is she doing this and i looked at her and i'm like i don't know but if you can figure it out let me know and of course <laughs> it put her off because you know she certainly didn't expect that response but like i don't have answers to everything and we just roll with the punches you know what works today may not work tomorrow but 
I mean, and there, in, in one particular, another situation, we were at a restaurant and she cleared the table. She was so mad. She cleared the table. And I felt so bad for the hostess because she wanted to be helpful. She, she really did, but she just didn't have the tools to do it. And, and, and I, I don't, I don't, I don't know what the right answer is That's when good. those situations well, happen, okay. You're doing good. you know, but be care, be caring. Don't point, don't, don't just judge. Don't just think, oh, it's, it's a parenting issue. It's because we've let her get away with things. Cause and effect doesn't work with her. We can't say if you do this, you're going to get in trouble. It just doesn't work that way. And it's not like if she does this and she gets in trouble, she'll know next time not to do it. It just doesn't work that way. So just being respectful and, and just thinking to yourself, it's like, what would I do if, if, if I was in that situation? How would I feel? And a lot of times we're mortified. We hate when those things happen in public. We really, really do, but. They, they happen. They happen. Um, in, in your spare time, uh, do an internet search for Ethan Saylor. Um, he was a young man with, with Down syndrome who's now dead because he was having a bad time and those around him decided they were gonna intervene yeah. and he wound up dead. So I won't, I won't go, I'll let you see all the rest of the story. It's very well documented, but, but that's a case where he was having a bad time and, he, and nothing really needed to happen right then, but those around him decided something is gonna happen now and he's dead. Um, to, to your question about terminology, we don't um, like the R word. We, we don't like the R word. Uh, she has an intellectual disability. I, 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 I readily admit that. Uh, in, in, my, in the Emily Talks, I, I tell everybody, if, if you have Down syndrome, you have an intellectual disability. It, it's, it just, it's, come, it's part of the package. Yeah. Um, we don't like mongoloid. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, like, that's even, that's that's the, even farther that's, out. That's, but yeah, but like person first language. Uh, she's, not, she's not a Down syndrome adult. She's an adult with Down syndrome. So use the person first. And, 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 but, but as far as interacting with people in the public, if, if, we, if you have a question, if you see us, I mean, if we're having a bad time, you can certainly ask if, if you can help. But even if we're not having a bad time, if you just have a question about yeah. anything, yeah. ask. Yeah. You know? if, if we got time, we'll answer. Yeah. You know, we run into, we, we meet a lot of yeah, people. Yeah, we meet a lot of people. We meet a lot of people. <laughs> well, we, we, we meet a lot of people that will approach us and say, listen, I, I've got a, I've got a family member, you know, and you know, you guys are doing great, whatever. But yeah. Emily, when she's in the right mood, is outgoing to a fault. Yeah, I've. We've I've, met you know, more people in parking lots and at the counters of car rentals or elevators. Elevators. Yeah. This Just, is my dad. Hug him. This is my dad. Oh, Hug oh. him. This is my mom. Her name is Tina. And, and now pandemic rules say that's totally out. But but pre-pandemic. It's still not socially, socially, socially acceptable for me to just hug this guy that I, I only know him because I'm standing next to him in an elevator. But there are times where she, that's, that's her demand, like much like with the Dr. Pepper now, she wants me to hug that guy and we're not moving on until that happens. <laughs> until it happens. So, and most of the time people, they, they understand and they, like, they, oh, okay. they, let's get this over with and we can all move on with our lives. I'm curious to know what a really great day looks like for Emily and also what a really great day looks like for you guys as parents. And if those two are obviously related, thanks. Yeah. They are obviously, Camping. they usually obviously related. Um, yeah, she, she loves to ride her bike. She has a three wheeler. Uh, we have tried She's been through two classes to try to learn how to ride a two-wheeler. It didn't work. She rides a three-wheeler, and she rides it till the wheels fall off. She's on bike number four at this point. Um, and we've actually replaced tires. How many yeah. people have? How many people there right now have replaced tires on bicycles because they've worn down the tread? So True story. Our, our our driveway. We have a, a kind of a substantial driveway, and she has the ability to to ride around a barn and just and and circle, she will do that for hours. Uh, just, uh, we like to go camping, so if we can facilitate getting her bike there and, and provide a, a safe place for her to ride at the campground, she rides her bike. So a great day for her is staying home and riding her bike. Um, at the height of the pandemic, uh, and this kind of goes back to the scheduling question, the work question, uh, we were changing schedules so that we, so the one of us was always home. Um, and so, so there was weeks, a period of weeks, maybe months where she never left our house so she bad. and it was it was summertime so she and she has no concept of the pandemic she doesn't get any of that 
She just knows that for that long period of time, she's got to stay home every day and ride her bike. You know, so from a silver lining standpoint, that, that was wonderful. A good day for me is Emily, Aunt Lori's, and me on the back of my horse. <laughs> good day for you. Good day for Cof you. Coffee, coffee are now green tea. I'm trying to, I'm trying to cut down, so now it's green tea. But, um, but sitting on the front porch, drinking whatever it is I'm drinking, and if she's out front riding her bike, yeah. Yeah. and it's a nice sunny day, Great, thank you. Um, Erin, I know you wanted to come on and say something. Is she still here? Hi. Hi, Hi Tom. Hi, Emily. Hi, Tina. Um, I don't really have a question because I'm friends with Tom on Facebook and I've known him for quite a while, but um, I just wanted to come on here and thank you for educating the community about people with developmental and intellectual disabilities because I work with that population on a daily basis and there's things that I have learned from Tom that have helped me do my job. Um, as a former um, EMT, there are people that come into the facility that I work at and I'm like, man, they have not listened to the Emily talk. <laughs> so I just appreciate the fact that you guys are constantly putting yourselves out there and giving us valued information that we can use in our own lives like you know if you are dealing with a person who has a disability you know you've taught me that you need to come down to their level you know get on the same um level with them and it might take you 20 minutes to figure out what's wrong with them but you'll eventually get it or you won't get it but you got to move on right. and take care of the the client or the person that you're dealing with. So I just, I really just appreciate all of the classes that you put on for first responders and teachers and just the general community. I listened to the Emily ta talk for the first time. I sat still for that hour and listened um, <laughs> um, when I was an EMT. And I can honestly tell you that that class, that talk, helped me to be a better EMT. So thank you for doing that and putting yourselves out there. You do a really great job and you both are just really great parents. I've seen you in the community with her when she's not having a good day and you guys just handle yourselves very well. You know, you it probably tears you up on the inside but you don't let anybody show that it's bothering you. You just go about your business and you get what you got to get done. So I do, I just appreciate everything you guys put out there about Emily and thank you for sharing your story. Well, thank you, Aaron. And, Thanks, Aaron. And a big part of that is because when 25 years ago when Emily was born, none of this existed. There was, there was very little, there, there was, there was very little in a way of, of, of support from anybody else that's going through this same situation. There was, the, you, couldn't, you couldn't just at a moment's notice pick up your phone and find out whatever you need to know about whatever you want to know about. Um, so, so it was, I mean, we had, to, we had to take a crash course in Down syndrome and intellectual disabilities and heart defects and, and you know, the list goes on and on and on. So, so I think from a, being a productive member of society standpoint, this is, this is Emily's, this is her, this is her deal. You know, she's, as, and instead of shipping her off to a, a sheltered workshop or having her wipe tables at a restaurant or whatever. Her job is to this, teach you. This is, this is her, uh, this is her deal. She's teaching people, how, teaching people about her. But the excellent, thank you, Erin, thank you for your kind words. Thank you. It made me cry. We have a question from Kathy. Would you like to come on and ask? I was wondering uh, where Emily goes without you two and with whom you trust her. She goes oh. to Aunt Lori's. <laughs> she goes to Aunt there, Lori's. Yeah, that, that club is, is a very exclusive club. Yes. Uh, <laughs> she, is, she is very rarely, if ever, unattended. There's always someone tending to her. Um, if she's in the house, if we're at home and, and she's in the house and we're outside, she's fine. She's fine. Uh, but if we're out in public, 
She is never unattended because she, if nothing else, she's a flight risk. Well, she's, she's never decide, unattended on purpose. <laughs> well, yeah, she, yeah, let's go there. She's never been unattended on purpose, purpose. Um, because we just don't know if she, you know, she's going to see something shiny in the next aisle if we're in a store and wander off and now now we've lost her and, she, and because of her disability she she doesn't she she won't she won't know to come find us yeah. she doesn't understand that she's become separated from us it's it's not it's just not something she understands so um as we said she spends a lot of time with my sister when we're working when there's or even sometimes even when we're not working because she likes to hang out there she's got her own her own room there um but, and, and there are other folks around that, that, um, that we do trust to take her places. Uh, when she was at Boone Grove High School, they have a very strong peer, peer tutor program um, where, the, where the, the neurotypical students would come into the, the LRE classroom and help, help Emily and all her classmates navigate through the day. Uh, we, we remain very close to some of those peer tutors, even though Emily's out of school and they're all out of school, one of them lives in Texas. Lauren Adler. But we still, shout out Lauren to Lauren. Adler. Lauren Adler. <laughs> but we still, we still keep up with those folks. Yeah. And when they're in town, they still come yeah, around. She, and yeah, they she, FaceTime with Emily. And, um, and, Lauren, and Adler. Lauren is one that we would, you know, Lauren could come by and yeah. pick her up yeah. and take her to lunch. Yeah, we, Lauren could do that. that yeah. Um, so one question is, does Emily have friends or an opportunity to socialize with other adults her age? Chasing dreams would probably be the place that she could do that. Chasing yeah. yeah, chasing dreams would be a place where we could take her there, and they could do, like, they could do a movie night there, or they could do just, some baking, some cook, you know, you know that sort of interaction. But as far as to, to her out in public with like a group of people, mm, I'm not sure. No, no I'm e even even pre-pandemic. Um, yeah, we'll get Mexican when we're done. We're worried about dinner. Um, <laughs> Pre-pandemic, there was still, uh, I mean, we, we just didn't. We don't we, trust her. Let's we, just put it like that. We don't trust her. <laughs> we, would, we would go out with family in that. And, and actually, uh, because we have the ability to do so land-wise and room-wise um, every year, at least pre-pandemic, uh, we, have, we have hosted a, a uh, Chasing Dreams Family Day at our place, where we invite all those folks to come out and hang out, and we cook just, out. Just be kids. And yeah, and just play, and and they get to see your horses. And when we had chickens, they got to see the chickens. Um, but it's just a chance for them to come out and 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 all hang out in a safe environment. It's tough to to go places and just be a, a kid or or a young adult because we have to take so many precautions. Even pre-pandemic, we have to take so many precautions to keep her safe. We have another anonymous question. Uh, how is it different now than compared to when Emily was three or six or 10? And I want to add a layer to that. Um, like, how, how has it been creating your expectations as parents for Emily, too, from those ages? How has she evolved, and then how have your expectations evolved? Well, medically, she's involved, she has evolved a million-fold. Uh, she was a very sick little girl. Uh, we spent a lot of time down at Riley Hospital in Indianapolis. We um, had nursing care. We had nursing care in our home. Yeah. Till she was probably a year and a half, maybe. Yeah. For for a while, her bedroom looked like a, a hospital room. Yeah. We had you a, know, stocked with supplies and, yeah. and a nurse, we had a nurse and twelve hours a day, seven days a week. So. Then, yeah. So yeah. That has evolved. So a big a big stumbling block was. We we're just realistic. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we. As far yeah as far as expectations. Because this is all new to us, it was all new to us. You know, we're gonna you know, we're gonna do all these programs, and she's gonna learn to write well, and she's gonna learn to read well, and she's gonna learn to, you know, do all these things. But you know, as evolved, things evolved, and and then we realized that we had to change those expectations. We had to tailor them a little bit so they were realistic. You know, learned what what is really what is really realistic as far as what she's going to be able to accomplish and to do, you know. Yeah, and because we're 25, in, 25 years into this process, um, our expectations now are much different than someone who's, who has a, 
a, a, baby, a, a baby, a new baby. And they are convinced that that baby is going to do everything that their neurotypical, neurotypical. siblings are going to do. And I've had face-to-face -face conversations with families that have that that now, partly because of my conversations with them, no don't, longer don't participate in ch chasing chasing dreams, because I I had to be realistic with them and say, listen, I understand that that you want your 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 child with Down syndrome to do everything that your neurotypical other other neurotypical kids can do. It's not going to happen. I mean, you can you can certainly be um, their best advocate. Yeah, you, yeah. Do what you can, but but understand that 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 she's not going to drive. She's not. There's there's all kinds of things that she's just not going to do. And do I do I get hung up on that, or do we just continue doing what we're doing and let her live her best life, knowing that she's not going to be that she's not going to compare. If if I have to compare her to her sister, who has two college degrees, and and three kids, and working on her third, and and working on her third. Um, it's just not gonna, the, 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 it's, it's apples and oranges. Yeah. Can I ask a follow-up to that? Yeah. Absolutely. So I'm thinking about uh, my nephews who, and nieces who go from being 20 pounds or 30 pounds or 40 pounds to growing up enough that they're physically, like it, your interactions with them physically change. I wonder if you could talk about how that has uh, changed for you over time as Emily's grown into an adult. Yeah. Well, that the, the, the situation we spoke of earlier when she decided to have a meltdown in the intersection, as a child, you can pick them up and, you know, move them out of the way. But as adults, you can't do that. You have to, you know, you have to reason if you can. Or, like I said, it got ugly. We had to drag them. And that's where, that's where you know, their, their body continues to grow, but their intellect kind of stays stagnant. So... It, it gets it gets kind of difficult to wrestle with those types of situations with adults, you know that that you need to remove from, say, a, a restaurant or you know, a dinner table or it, you you need to leave. We're we're done in the store and now we need to leave now. You know this one particular kid we know he has autism and he's like six four three hundred pounds, you know. You can't make him do anything. And that's where Tom speaks of being patient. You figure out, you know, what you can do to keep him safe. And then when he figures out he's ready to go, then you go. But size is a huge issue. I, have, I had a girlfriend who, whose daughter was super sick as a baby. And they're both well over six feet tall. And so, and, you know, she, was, she had se severe cerebral palsy. And they worried about when... Her, her particular daughter would be grown, you know, she could have easily been six feet tall. They were, they worried about her care. And, you know, I, it's caring for them as they grow older, you know, it's certainly an issue. Because things that worked for them as a child certainly would not necessarily work the same way as they grow older. Because when Emily was little and she was bad, I could pick her up and I could forcibly take her. You can't do that now. She's 25 and she's 160 pounds. So I can't do that. I can't do that. The gentleman I spoke of, Ethan Saylor, um, he was 23 when he died. He was five foot four, 294 pounds, uh, sitting, sitting in a theater seat and not wanting to leave. There was no reason for him to leave, but, but those around him decided he was going to leave. And so now they're trying to manhandle five foot four, 294 pounds out of a movie theater. If he doesn't want to go, he's not going to go. He didn't want to go, and now he's dead. So, so from a physical standpoint, from a from a what can I do with her? I can't. If if she doesn't want to go, and and there's no reason for her to go right this very second, we don't go. We don't go. Hey guys. Hi. Say hi, Tanya. No. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> She's saying hi to us. Our our years are coming up as far as Haley being 18. And being in the routine of going to school every day, and how was your transition out of school? And do you have any advice for us for when our day comes? <laughs> Listen, it was amazing when you'd have to get up every morning and get them off to school. Um, that's I, well, I, what it was nice. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. Well, it was nice. when like, like I said, when when Emily was a senior, we did the open house. We she walked with her class. We did all the stuff the seniors do. 
and then she and she just kept on going and we did it all again we didn't have an open house again but we but she walked again um so and she was fine with that routine she knew yeah. you know the bus the bus pulled up to our garage door and picked her up yeah. so um so that that worked well yeah i think know. it's just about creating more you know different routines you know more structure but but I'm sure Haley is the mirror image of Emily. You know, they're built on structure. And so, you know, with, you know, Haley, just keeping her in some kind of, you know, not letting her sleep till noon. You know, let's get up, let's get motor, let's get our bath, let's eat breakfast, let's, you know, still maintaining, maintaining some sort of structure. But listen, when you don't have to get up in the morning and get them off to school, it's amazing. <laughs> it's amazing. So yeah, so Not structure is lie. important, but, but it can be another structure. It can yeah, be a structure yeah. that starts later in the day. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Great. Thank you guys. Vero, would you like to ask? Yeah, I have a question because I've been following a little girl who's now 11. I started to follow her when she was four. And um, I could see the change in behavior. Um, but I also, my observation was that she sometimes knew exactly what she was doing and what she could get away with. Can yeah. you that? Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah there's, a, there's a small bit of that. Um, like, she pushes our buttons. There are situations where she I, I i know she knows better you know but i i i don't know but but right she knows better but she doesn't always understand understand cause and effect yeah you know she i i can i can say a million times if you don't do this this is going to happen first of all if i don't follow through it, it's an idle it's an idle threat it's not going to go anywhere but but even even if i follow through she doesn't the next time that situation comes up we're, we're, we're going to play the same there's game. There's no recollection. Yeah, there's, you know, so it, it's, it's very, that's very frustrating. And that's where patience comes in. You know, if she's not ready to go, and I hate to keep pointing that out, but it, but it happens all the time. If she's not ready to go, or if she is ready to go and we're not ready to go, then we have to go, well, okay, I guess maybe we are ready to go. Yeah. And, and we go, you know, because there's... I can't just say, no, we're not ready to go yet. I, with, the, with this Dr. Pepper right now, I can't just tell her, we'll put it in the fridge in a little bit. It had to be done right now or there's going to be trouble. So we did it right now. The other thing I'm struggling with is that um, I'm also, I mean, aside from working with, with uh, uh, Carmen um, from far away, I'm also working on my own documentary called Raising Zulia about this little girl and her mother. And uh, I'm always struggling about the labeling. But how do you not label somebody when you talk about the condition? So how do you, what do you do? Well, that, that's a, that's a, a, there's a very fine line between, <laughs> there's a very fine line between, Mexican? yeah, we'll get Mexican when we're done. There's a very fine line between um, doing what's right and, and doing it just so, just to keep the peace. Um, and maybe too often we do it just to keep the peace. But what what are the what are the ramifications of that? What I mean, sometimes it just doesn't it doesn't matter. I mean, if she wants to wear that, there was there was issues this morning getting ready to leave for this event, and and we're and we're arguing about footwear for the day, um, and so and, and it turned out to be a nice day, so it was irrelevant. But I know she loves to wear flip flops. So finally, I gave up on the sneakers. And I said, listen, you want our flip flops and we're good. You know, now, even if it was not nice today and if that's what works, I would have said, let's wear flip flops and we're good to go. Um, but sometimes it's just the, the, the path of least resistance comes up a lot, you know, and, and good, bad or otherwise. Sometimes that's what helps us get through the day. I understand that. My second question was about um, the labeling. How Whenever I speak about my film, I say I'm making a film about a person with Down syndrome. Oh, with labeling. Oh, I'm, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm trying, I'm trying to figure out a way to tell my story. Oh, nice. That having to always say it's about a girl with Down syndrome. But yet, if I don't say that, then I'm not telling it about it. I'm, sorry, I'm a little bit confused about what is the appropriate way of explaining my story. Well, no, I think, I think that's perfectly fine to explain yeah. it that way, yeah. as long as you're using person first vocabulary. Oh, yeah. You know, it's, it's not, it's not, it's not the Down syndrome girl. Yeah. Well, but that's, that, I mean, 
that that label is why you are following her. Okay. You know, okay, I, I mean, wanted, yeah. I just wanted to hear. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. If 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 she doesn't have Down syndrome, you're not you're not doing anything with her. You know what I mean? I mean, <laughs> I, mean I mean, that's that's why. No, no, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. So yeah, please. I just wanted to make sure that it's an okay thing to constantly because yeah. constantly when I have to present the the story, I say right. this is a story about a mother and a girl who happens to have Down syndrome. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. If we don't if we don't um, promote the fact that she has Down syndrome. We're not having this conversation now. That that's that's why we're all here because of that condition. Absolutely. So okay. so that's that works. Okay. Yeah, you're doing fine. I don't think there's any shame in that. Like there no. shouldn't be shame in that. We're, we're right. here to learn. Right. Yeah. 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 We we totally own this. This is this is us. You know. Yeah. So if if you wanna if you wanna learn about us, here we are. Great. <laughs> I struggle with this when making the film, but we talk a lot about Emily with her there and her not chiming in. Can you talk a little bit about, like, is that okay? How do you feel about that as a parent? Well, I think it's okay. Um, in the Emily talk, and I and I try to remember to preface my Emily talks every time with with saying something like, "Listen, I'm going to say things that, taken right. as as a Take as a standalone time. comment, are just plain ass mean about Emily." I'm going to tell you that she's like a slow computer and she takes time to process information. That's not being mean, that's being realistic. In the, in the context of, I want you to understand how things go with her, I'm going to have to say things about her that like, like if, uh, if it was a standalone statement, it's just mean. But, but in the context of, of helping you understand her, I have to say things about her that just aren't nice. But again, I. It, if, if you want us to, if, if you want us to, you know, if you want me to paint a rosy picture that, that, that's always unicorns and butterflies, I can do that, but, but, but now you're gonna leave with, with uh, an unrealistic expectation of what you would run into if you run into Emily. Thank you. Um, I wanna give, since we hit the hour mark, I wanna give people permission to sign off, but we will stick around for any other questions. <laughs> Um, and then we'll have Mexican. Um, <laughs> so I just want to thank you all again for coming. Um, happy World Down Syndrome Day. And I really encourage you to like soak in what you've heard today and and seek out more stories like the filters and really, really like immerse yourself in this world because I think it's important to just be exposed to perspectives like theirs. Um, yeah, I don't know. I've changed a lot as a human being knowing you guys and I think it's for the better and I'm really grateful to know them. So um, if you guys feel inspired to please share our film's website with everyone you know. We're trying to get this in front of as many eyes as possible so we can get funded and get this message out. We have a community outreach plan with this film where we would go to local um, Down syndrome organizations and screen the film for first responders and other community members so that we can educate people on how to communicate with folks with Down syndrome and also just share this family's story. So um, anything you guys can do to help us out is great. And, th and you're already helping us out in a huge way by being here and listening to their story. I just um, want to tell you, I am so grateful that you're so honest about your journey. I just think that's incredible that, um, that you can be honest because not everybody is. And I think that helps so much. I just wanted to say that. Well, right. And, and we've, we've talked about it here in our group and, and we kind of touched on it a little bit today, but, but some, of, some of the things you see on TV give you unrealistic expectations of how this really goes. And you see it on TV or you see it on the internet, so it must be true, but it's not always true. Yeah. You know, so, right. so we're doing what we can to make you understand that, you know, when, when that Dr. Pepper needs to go in the fridge right now, it needs to go in the fridge right now. Right. Yeah, it's funny. I was just talking about the resources page, and you can go and check all of those out and read about Down syndrome and the misconceptions, but you don't really, you don't really get the essence without knowing someone like Emily. Um, then you understand. So I encourage you all to go out of your comfort zone and really make an effort okay. to meet more people like Emily. Um, Mexican. When Emily was young, did you have a, a what they call early intervention? Because uh, that's what my 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 friend had. 
uh, meaning that uh, she was uh, uh, um, uh, involved with different things, like when she was a few months old, and um, and it made a difference. So, is there something that did exist at that yeah, time? Yeah, they not? have early intervention here in Indiana. She had physical therapy and speech therapy, and some of which were were at our house. She was little, little, like you know, even when we had nursing care, we had physical therapy and speech therapy in our house a couple days a week. So yeah, they started very, very early, you know, less than a year old. So I think that helped a lot. It got her walking sooner, you know, but yeah, I think that played a, a, a great, a great part in getting her up and about and walking sooner. Awesome, I know Jason, you had a question in the chat we didn't get to, do you wanna ask? I just feel like I'm monopolizing all your time because this is my third question now, but, uh... Does Emily have a favorite type of music? Does she react differently to different types of music or like, how does that show up? No, um, she does like music. That That is our bridge to her world is music. She loves, she's a big thing for Hannah Montana. She loves, um, she loves that whole, you know, early days, Miley Cyrus. She likes Taylor, she loves Taylor Swift. We're big country music fans. So she lists, listens to a lot of country music. We've taken to a lot of concerts. Um, concerts are kind of concerts are kind of iffy. We 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 went and took her to a Taylor Swift concert at uh, Soldier Field. Paid an enormous amount of money for it, and she hated it. It was too much stimulation. You know, we took earphones. It it was just it was too much. We do a lot of county fairs because they're they're you know they're low budget. You know, and she can wear her headphones. And we're kind of particular about where we sit. And she tends to do do those types of concerts well, but. But country music is kind of the music we listen to, so that's what kind of she listens to. But she loves she loves Miley Cyrus. She loves Taylor Swift. That's okay. So I am young, and you know, in the future, I will have children. So, what is some advice that you would provide those future adults um, that you would have changed as you were going into the process? Like, um. Uh, I don't know. I don't know how to say it. I don't want to be disrespectful. So uh, with uh, with helping Emily grow up, that's what I want to say. What's the rest of advice? If you were to have a child with a disability, yeah. is that, yeah. Go, it goes back to person first language. It, it's, it's, still, it's still a baby. It's still a beautiful little baby. Yeah. You know, love them. And, and, you know, you still might have to do di things differently than what you thought you might have to do but you still have a child and, and you know, the, the is, disability you know, is second to that. Like have with a normal newborn, worry about those things when you have to, worry about the things at hand, worry about if they have any, any medical uh, uh, issues that need to be addressed. My thing is, a lot of people worry about those things so prematurely. You ha you'll have to worry about that stuff in due time. Take take care of yourself and then love your baby for what it's worth. Don't worry about those things now. I mean, with if you had a normal baby, those are certainly not things that you'd be addressing at that moment in your life. So put those things aside and worry about them when you have to. Worry about the things at hand now. Enjoy your baby because there's so much of her when she was little that I wish we could do differently because we were so worried about, I was so worried about, her not being able to go to school because our oldest daughter was in it, it, you know, she did so well in school. She was in advanced placements and, you know, she did, she did very well academically. And so that was our, our thing. Well, how will she ever do this? You know, she, I, I just compared her to Sarah so much, but you just, you just don't do that. You just take your baby for what it's worth and enjoy your baby while he or she is little and then address the situations as you need to as they as, as they come up. Josh, find the poem, Welcome to Holland. Welcome to Holland. By Emily Pearl Kingsley. Write yes. that down. Welcome to Holland, Emily Pearl Kingsley. And that helps put Kingsley. everything in perspective. You know, it really, really, really does. In fact, as a labor and delivery nurse, I at times would give that. Not, not all parents are receptive to those to that so soon, especially if they didn't know. But I would give that poem out to moms that I felt needed it. And that really helped to transition them, you know, with their, their new baby. But yeah, it, it's a great, great, great poem. I don't, I don't really have a question, but um, 
I just figured out how to put my little hand up. So I wanted to put it up. But anyway, so no, I, in response to the one question that was asked about Emily's favorite music, um, the most, the, the one thing that I know she absolutely goes berserk over and she can do every single lyric, every single dance move, every non-dance move is pitch perfect movies. She will, oh. you put those on and she is off. I don't oh. care what's her stuff. The, you know, the, the dance moves come out and she is busting a move like crazy. Like she knows all the moves, all the, and I have two-year-old grand twins, a boy and a girl. And now that's the little girl. She always says, Emily, dance, Emily, dance. She wants to watch Pitch Perfect now because that's what Emily does. And so now Raylan has to get up and instead of watching, you know, Toy Story, Raylan's wanting to watch, you know, Pitch Perfect because that's a cool thing to do. So that was my one comment. And my other comment was to Josh, the question you just asked about, um, you know, if you happen to have a, a, a child with special needs, from, from being on the outside kind of sort and watching Tom and Tina, that's my brother and sister-in-law. Um, the one thing is huge is if, if that ever happens, um, always first thing you do is you go out there and you bust a hump to find the support groups in your area. You know, that, that right there, there's cause, cause there's a million people within a five mile radius that are dealing with the same thing that you're going to be dealing with. So that's a huge thing. They've all went through it already, you know, or, or maybe they're in the same level as you, the same beginning process. But that's a huge, huge thing. I would, I would, I, I, I would suggest, you know, if that does or whatever. And then also know that, you know, you like Haley. H Haley is also, um, you know, a child with Down syndrome. And then Chance, who just signed off as well, you know, they're going to do things. They may drive. Emily's not going to. That doesn't mean they won't. You know, they may have a regular job. That doesn't mean Emily will or Emily won't, you know, it's just everybody's different and it has nothing to do with what Tom and Tina are doing or what they're not doing or what, you know, uh, Tanya and um, Justin are doing or not doing. It's, it's the individual themselves. They're always, they're different from each other as, as far as intellectual and disabilities and things like that. So it's just crazy and you'll figure it out. At, like Tina says, as time goes. Yeah, can you guys talk a little bit more about that spectrum or how there are different variations of well, functioning? Or well, if you think about people, I mean, you have some people that are smarter. I, I didn't say smarter, that's probably, but some people that excel in other areas, that some people are more intellectual, some people do better in school than others. And I think you can apply that same concept to people with Down syndrome. Some people with Down syndrome struggle more than others. Some people with Down syndrome have more of a, a higher um, intellect than other people. I mean, I think it's, it's important to realize that there, I, I wouldn't say there's varying degrees, but I think they're just people that, 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 that do better in school or um, have a higher, uh, I don't say intellect, but have a Well, but that's true. They, they, yeah, every, every, not everybody has the same level of intellect. Some Neurotypical people, people still, there's, there's still ranges there. Yeah. Um, some people that are more neuro, that are neurotypical, some go to college, some don't. You know, some, some do well in life, some don't. I think you can, again, you can apply that same, that same thought to people with Down syndrome or autism or whatever, you know, disability you're looking at. There's some people that, that, are more affected by that disorder than others. Right. So at some point, do you separate Down syndrome as an intellectual disability and look more at Emily as a unique person and other, like, how do you know this is because of Down syndrome? This is because- of Well, that's, sometimes you don't. That's true. Um, but Down syndrome, now she is labeled, there are varying labels of disabilities. She is labeled, she's been labeled moderately mentally handicapped. So, I mean, of course, with that being said, they're mild and then they're severe. So um, based on how she functions, she's been, she's been labeled moderately mentally handicapped. And there's a whole, with Down syndrome, there's a whole laundry list of physical things that come along with it. Uh, um, Autism is a big thing. Well, yeah, but um, a lot of different heart things. She, and, she's, and we've checked off most of that list. Yeah. Uh, cardiac wise and things like that. So there's, there's things that, that, that we have to deal with that we know are pretty much because she has Down syndrome. Now sometimes, sometimes her attitude is just because 
I mean, she's 25 now, but when she was a teenager, we could say, well, she's, she's a teenager. And that's why she's having an attitude right now, not because she has Down syndrome, but because she has a teenager and she doesn't want to do what I want her to do. Yeah. You know, so, so where's, that, where's that line between it's because she has Down syndrome or just because she's a human being with, with a thought process? Have you guys explored the autism diagnosis well that that's another gray uh, i mean we have thought about it but what what good would it do us i mean if she does then she i mean it i mean i don't know that you get therapy for autism i don't i don't know that i i i just don't know that it we would benefit or she would need we just don't i mean it's a diagnosis that wouldn't get us anything i mean some of, some of her characteristics are something that goes along with down syndrome or goes along with being on the spectrum some there, there's some overlap there so so yes we could we could run her through the testing and have her labeled as being on the spectrum but to what end that's that's not going to do us any good other than give her another label right if you guys could have like one call to action for everyone here what would it be i i mean i yeah i mean you have to be patient i mean not just not just with with <laughs> you okay there not with not just with with someone like Emily, but anybody, you know, anybody you meet on the street, you have no idea. There, there's a saying that I, I can't attribute it to. I'm not sure who said it, but but everyone you meet is fighting a battle you know nothing about. So be kind. Thank you guys, and thank you all for coming. Do we have? If we don't have any other questions, I think we're gonna let y'all get on with your Sunday. Bye, Bye Emily. Go get your Mexican, Bye. Mama. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, great. Happy World Down Syndrome Day.